the Bishop of Gloucester. My Lords, I should like at the outset to acknowledge the assistance that I've received from the Southall Black Sisters in preparing this amendment, and also to thank the Minister for her time and compassion in discussing this with me. Amendment 70 is tabled in my name with the support of Lord Rosser, Baroness Gowdy and Baroness Hamry, and I'm grateful to every one of them. I know the protection of all victims of domestic abuse is a priority of noble lords across the House, and I'm grateful for the support shown for this amendment, which aims to provide migrant victims of abuse with temporary leave to remain and access to public funds for a period of no less than six months so that they can access support services while they flee abuse and apply to resolve their immigration status. The mechanism for doing so is straightforward. Extending the eligibility criteria of the existing domestic violence DV rule, which is a proven route for a limited group of survivors, including those on certain spousal and partner visas. The government raised some concerns over the interpretation of the amendment, so we've made a couple of minor changes to subsections one and two to clarify the purpose of this amendment. There is also an updated explanatory note. I hope that what is now clear from the minor changes to the wording is that we are asking for temporary leave to remain and access to public funds, while these extremely vulnerable people escape their abusers and regularise their immigration status. This is not about guaranteeing indefinite leave to remain to all migrant victims of abuse. My Lords, at committee stage, I highlighted the need for such an arrangement, and I will not go over similar ground here or repeat the stories I shared then. In response to the government's counter arguments received at committee stage and in discussion, I would wish to make three points this afternoon. Firstly, I will speak about legitimate expectation of settlement. When the DV rule was introduced, the stated purpose behind the measure was to enable abused migrant women who would otherwise remain trapped to leave an abusive relationship. There was no suggestion that the DV concession, as it was then known, was being introduced primarily because of a legitimate expectation by spouses to remain in the UK. I would argue that the law should provide protection for people on all visa types where there's evidence of domestic abuse, since many have insecure status through no fault of their own. We know that domestic violence often dramatically changes women's circumstances and expectations and the immigration rules should reflect this. And I say women not to exclude men, but because the experience and data has come from those working with women. The number of additional applications likely to be made each year if eligibility for the DV rule and DDVC was extended is estimated to be in the low thousands, with an increase of possibly only around 2,000 annually. But the impact will be life-saving and life-changing. The DV rule and the DDVC already works well for those who are able to access it. Extending eligibility to primarily women on other types of visas is a straightforward solution to what is often a complex and challenging situation for many migrant survivors of abuse. It will also remove the power of abusers to weaponize someone's immigration status to exert absolute control and will allow people to hold their abusers to account by being able to report them. Secondly, the government is concerned that the expansion of eligibility for the DV rule and DDVC would, and here I quote Baroness Williams, introduce a route to settlement that might lead to more exploitation of our immigration system, or indeed of vulnerable migrants. This claim has no basis in evidence. The DV rule and DDVC have operated since 2002 and 2012 respectively, but there is no evidence whatsoever that the routes have led to the abuse of the immigration system. The reason 
is that there is already in place robust criteria and assessment mechanisms to guard against false claims and exploitation of the immigration system. I would therefore say that this claim is based on fear, not fact, and that is not a basis to make or avoid making good decisions. In 2018, 1,210 DDVCs were granted, out of which only 575 victims were subsequently granted leave to remain, demonstrating that there is an established criteria that must be met for someone grant to be granted leave to remain. This criteria and assessment procedure effectively present any exploitation of the immigration system. It's simply not the case that those who make a claim of domestic violence will be able to easily exploit the immigration system since the assessment procedure to obtain settlement under the DV rule is rigorous. My Lords, not only is this concern lacking in evidence, but it's lacking in logic. If, for an example, an abuser manipulated a woman to regularise her status under the DV rule for the purpose of exploiting the immigration system, the abuser would be aiding a woman to report abuse, which could lead to criminal proceedings against him, the abuser. Furthermore, it would lead that woman to access a pathway to support and protection, which would enable her to get away from the control of the abuser. I would welcome some further explanation from the government on this point, because to me, it simply does not stack up. Thirdly, the pilot scheme created by the government to seek more evidence of the numbers of victims involved. This is inadequate for a number of reasons. The pilot fails to appreciate the urgency and the seriousness of the risk of abuse and destitution that abuse migrant, mainly women, on non-spousal visas currently face. Even as an interim measure, the 1.4 million allocated to the pilot fund is nowhere near sufficient to address what is an urgent and mounting crisis. At a stretch, the pilot project is likely to provide only minimal and basic support for up to 500 women for a maximum period of 12 weeks. If this pilot seeks to collect more data, I would highlight again that this has already been submitted by key specialist organisations during the review process. And as I highlighted at committee stage, there is no guarantee that any lasting change will follow when the scheme is ended. It is only legislative protection for this vulnerable cohort of mainly women that will ensure this bill delivers its promise as landmark legislation, which can deliver protection for all survivors in the UK. I do look forward to hearing what the minister has to say this afternoon, but I do intend to press this to a vote. I beg to move. Amendment proposed. After Clause 72, insert the new clause as printed in the Marshall List. 